my story has never been a political story. This is I'm not making any kind of political statement. I'm not mm. making I've I've avoided that like the plague. I just mm. do not I don't get into those discussions because I really feel that everyone's journey or everyone's path or you know whatever whatever they choose in life is what they choose for themselves. Absolutely. And and I think that back then when I did decide to retransition, you know, I really freaked a lot of people out. Hello and welcome to the 50 Shades of Gender podcast. We get curious about all things gender, sex and sexuality, as well as relationships, feminism, the inclusive kind, mental health and kink, and all that makes us humans unique and diverse. From body positivity to body dysmorphia, it's all welcome here. If you like what we do and want to make a contribution, you can become a patron on Patreon, visit patreon.com forward slash 50 shades of gender, or buy us a coffee. Links are on the website. Now join us on a journey of inclusion, acceptance and respect. I'm your host, Esther Lemons. I am a cis queer woman and my pronouns are she and her. In this episode, I have a conversation with Brian Belovich, an author, actor and activist. Brian's pronouns are he, him, and his, and he identifies as a cis gay male of trans experience. Find out what that means to Brian in this episode. We also talk about being different and growing up in the 60s and 70s, looking for validation, living a fantasy life, performing the role of perfect woman, dealing with judgment, how everyone's journey is unique, finding a different way to be comfortable, and going full circle and reaching a new destination. It was recorded on the 26th of September, 2021. Now let's get into the episode. Hello and welcome. What's your name? Hi, I'm Brian Belovich. Hi, Brian. So tell me about your gender experience. This is quite a different story from the ones I've shared so far. So feel free to start wherever you like. (laughs) Okay. Well, I am someone who uh, was assigned male at birth. Mm -hmm. And at a very early age, transitioned to female. Uh, And this was during a time in the 70s and 80s when, you know, it wasn't quite as accepted as it is now. And then uh, in the 80s, uh, at the age of about 30, 31, through a series of events, I decided to retransition after living as a trans woman for almost 15 years, back to my male uh, gender. Uh, wow. Well, that, that was it in a nutshell, right? So, yeah. <laughs> wow. When you say you transitioned at a young age, what age was that initially? Well, I, I guess my story is traditional in some sense because I was always uh, misgendered as a little boy, which caused me a tremendous amount of confusion. Mm -hmm. as a kid um, with no one to explain why this was happening to this little five-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. And so eventually I started to internalize the messages that I was receiving from adults, from siblings, from teachers, from friends, you know, that, you know, maybe there was something wrong about my gender and that, um, you know, maybe everything that everyone has always been saying about me was true and that perhaps there was a mistake in my gender and that I, you know, maybe I I started to think along the lines that maybe I was a girl, maybe I should, should have been a girl. And so when I was old enough to act out on it uh, in my teens, like around 14, 15, I started to cross dress, not knowing what changing my gender meant at all back then. I would, you know, wear women's, you know, articles of clothing, or I would, you know, wear a purse, or I would wear something, you know, not quite what boys were wearing back then. Mm -hmm. And I started to uh, also get into drag. I started to run away from home and met other gay people and started dressing in drag and going out to the clubs and, you know, getting lots of attention for how I looked. Mm -hmm. And so it became, you know, more of a more serious for me when I got got a little older and I started uh, taking, you know, uh, hormone pills. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I was very young, so I started to develop little breasts very early on. And uh, I started to really fully transition because um, a very good friend of mine, for him, it was fun. It was drag. But for me, it was a way of getting validation for myself in a way that I had never found possible before as a child, as a teenager. Wow. And uh, it became like a drug for me in a way. Mm. Yeah. And so uh, when I was 19, I started to fully transition uh, with regular, you know, I started dressing 24 hours a day as female. I changed my name legally. I went to court and, you know, got a name change and, you know, my hair was growing longer and I, you know, I was living 24 seven as what the kids call it. Hey, you know, I was always presenting as female from that moment on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I just, you know, there, there, what the thing that is different now is that back then there were no, you know, the only thing I knew about uh, gender transformation was Christine Jorgensen. And, you know, even when I was a 14 year old, I went to the library and took the book out of the library and hid it in my room under my mattress. So no one would see me reading it. So that was the mm-hmm. only reference we had back then about someone who had decided to change their gender. Mm -hmm. So when you started your hormone treatment, was that in any way like supervised by medical professionals or was that something you just did yourself? No, it was through other other trans women that I had sort of, you know, when I ran away, you know, I I was always getting kicked out of my home. My parents were not accepting or loving or caring. and and They did not understand Mm -hmm. any of it. Uh, I came from a pretty working class, you know, rough and tough background. Mm -hmm. Um, My brothers, I have five brothers and one sister. They're all very heterosexual and uber masculine and you know, they were, I was even physically, they're much bigger than I was. They were like six feet five, you know, these like incredible athletes and uh, athletic. And I wasn't any of those things. So mm. it wasn't easy to, to be in my home. So I was always getting kicked out or running away. And finally I ran away and I joined a group of trans folks uh, who I met by my high school, this is a kind of an interesting story, by my high school, across the street, there was a building, a three-story apartment building, and you couldn't even make up this name. It was so perfect. It was called the Lola Apartments, L-O-L-A, right. like mm-hmm. the Lou Reed song, the, the you know, the, Lo- the kink song, Lola. Yeah, yeah. So it was called the Lola Apartments, and across, you know, you After class, my friends would go out and smoke a cigarette and watch these queens running in and out of the building, flagging down cars, running in and out of the beauty parlor, you know, um, with rollers in their hair. And it was like a scene out of like, you know, like Tales of the City, you know, East Coast style. And um, Mm. I was fascinated because I saw other people that I thought would be like me. Mm. And so eventually I made my way over there and, 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 and got friendly with them. And uh, that's where I ended up running away to. And uh, those folks, like older trans women, took me under their wing and, you know, taught me everything I needed to know about transitioning. And so I would get hormone pills from Mm -hmm. them. I did go to a doctor um, and, you know, lied about my age and got, you know, injections uh, a couple of times. Mm-hmm. But um, but by the time I was 19, I was getting medically supervised. But earlier on, no. Mm. Yeah. That was a long answer to your question. That's all good. <laughs> That's all good. So what happened after that? Let me just see. Looking at your bio here, you transition. Oh, well, you came out three times, it says. So one as a queer teen, first as a queer teenager, then yes. as a glamorous transgender woman named Tish. So yes. tell me a bit more about Tish. Well, In the 70s, um, and again, with this group of trans folks that I lived with at this apartment building, you know, we one day we went to the movies and uh, we went to see the uh, new film with Liza Minnelli, Cabaret, which came out. And uh, 
there was a character in the film that was played by Marissa Berenson. And uh, I, I never forget the scene. She opens the door and Michael York is standing there, very young and handsome. And she introduced herself to him and, and she says, hello, my name is Natalia. And I just love that name, Natalia. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, that's so exotic and so beautiful. And so I think, and I was in, we, it was a funny scene. We were in the movie theater and I was like, that's it. That's I'm going to be my name. It's going to be Natalia. And, you know, um, my mm -hmm. friend's like, shh, be quiet. We're going to get thrown out. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but back at the Lola apartments, there was a bunch of other trans women and drag queens who would do sex work at night, you know, even during mm -hmm. the day, but mostly at night. And one queen in particular, her name was Mona, uh, Mona Gomes. And she was a, a, a speed freak. She spoke like 20 miles a minute. She she talked really fast. You could hardly hear everything people she could say. And she could spit words out. So she could never say the word Natalia. Yeah. It was too much of a, a, a tongue twister for her. So she would she would call me N N Natisha, Natasha, Natishi, Natishi, Latasha, Latishi, you know, whatever your name is. And my <laughs> best friend thought that was really mm. hilarious. And yeah. he started calling me Tish. Ah, yeah, yeah. And so that became like a nickname. And then from then on, you know, close friends would call me Tish. Um, mm. even though my name was changed to Natalia mm -hmm. at the time. And then Tish, you know, was, you know, I was very young. I was very, you know, inspired by the, you know, women that were positive role models for me as a kid, like, you know, Ava Gardner and Lana Turner and, you know, Jane Mansfield and Marilyn Monroe. And so, you know, I wanted to be a pinup. You know, I wanted to be as glamorous and beautiful as I could. And so, you know, I modeled myself after those women. And um, I had done a lot of electrolysis. I had a, you know, nose job and my, uh, you know, I had a breast implants. You know, I had silicone, you know, use silicone uh, injections back then. It was very popular. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, everyone was running up to the doctor's office and pumping this treatment into their faces, their hips, their butts, you know. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I didn't go a little I didn't go too overboard with that. So mm -hmm. I ended up becoming quite attractive and nine times out of the 10, 10, most people did not know my gender at birth was not female. Mm -hmm. So I had what the kids call passing privilege. Yeah. And uh, I went to college and I, I did pretty much everything as a trans woman that people would, looking back now, they wouldn't think much of it. But back then, going to college as a trans woman, you know, I married a, I, I, I married a man mm. as a trans woman. I married a GI who was in the, you know, my, my boyfriend joined the army when he was you know, he's a little younger than me. And, and I, I ended up living in Germany with him on a, off a base in Germany as a military wife. Mm. And no one knew our little secret, you know, because I, I had perfected this identity. And, you know, I really, it was like my whole life was about just being it seemed anyway, looking back, it always it, looking back, it seemed like my whole life was just about being this perfect woman mm. or my idea of what a perfect woman uh, would be. Mm -hmm. And so um, as scary as it was to do, like I never really thought of consequences. I don't know. I think I was stoned most of the time. So I think that kind of prevented <laughs> me. You know, I smoked a lot of weed and drank a lot. And, you know, drugs are a really big part of my story, too, which was sort of the the moment in my life when I stopped using drugs and alcohol and really started to take a look at my life in a new way with a sober conscience is mm -hmm. when I started to realize that, you know, I did a lot of the things for many, for many of the wrong reasons. Mm hmm. And I yeah. was terribly unhappy, even though I was, you know, I mean, to look at me, you would think, wow, that person's really got it going on. You know, she looks fabulous. She's got a husband and a career and, 
you know, I was a singer and an actor and I was playing, you know, you know, I had a, was trying to carve out a little career for myself as an actor and played cisgender women's roles. You know, there wasn't anything that I did, didn't try to do Mm -hmm. um, as a trans woman, but every, every road I turned down to into was uh, there were obstacles and I was fun to have around and I was fun to be with and people love to invite me places and, you know, take me to, you know, fabulous events. And, you know, I became a producer and an actor and I had a show, you know, a stage persona, but, you know, really when it came down to it, that was very limiting because when I tried to have a career as an actor, when I tried to, you know, have a, have a music career, when I tried, you know, there were, those obstacles were not removed. People never took a trans person seriously. Like they would not, they would mm. only up until a point, it was okay. Right. You know, it's kind of like mm-hmm. with gay people, like sometimes like from the outside looking in, when you're a gay person, you, you're accepted a, up until a point. Mm-hmm. And so there was always like this, this sort of barrier that happened and it was very frustrating. And then of course, you know, I was doing quite a lot of drugs and, you know, I became a drug addict. I mean, I always had a, always drugs and alcohol were always a a part of my story for that up until that time for about 15 years or so, but um, things really escalated in the eighties and I, you know, became a a crack addict and uh, nearly you know, I'm, I almost didn't make it here today to have mm. this chat with you. But, mm. you know, so um, once I was able to get that problem solved, uh, I started to look inward and uh, things were, and I was getting older and I was, you know, thinking like, gee, I got to really do something with my life here. And um I was so unhappy, uh, Esther. I was, you know, I put on a really good front. Mm. And everything, like I said earlier, if you looked at me, you would think, wow, she's just fabulous. She's got, she's just, and this is the thing that really freaked people out when I eventually did come to understand that my gender was more than just me presenting as a, as a female. Mm -hmm. that my gender was fluid. Mm -hmm. You know, this is one of the reasons why I was so excited to talk to you today about this, because this is a new, not so new, but it is a a, a revelation now that we're understanding about gender is that it is fluid. It's not fixed. It's not binary. And for some people, which I totally understand and totally respect, gender is a destination for some people Mm -hmm. to arrive at and feel comfortable in. But for me, there was always, always this anxious apartness and this anxious irritability about like, is this really the right thing for me? I'm not, you know, like, even though it seemed like I really was comfortable, I was never really comfortable. Mm. I never liked the feeling that I had you know, I didn't fit in the straight world. I didn't fit in the gay world, mm. you know, in the trans world, it was, it was okay. It was kind of a safe place, but I really didn't like this feeling that I was always battling with of sort of not really feeling complete. Mm. And, uh, you know, once I started, started to look at gender with a new lens And look at what is masculine about me, what is feminine about me, what did I like that was masculine about myself, what did I like that was feminine about myself, I learned or I came to the realization that I could really incorporate the best of both worlds and have both. And I can be as feminine or, you know, soft and sensitive and whatever as I wanted to be, or I could be really, you know, tough and, and, you know, you know, this, I'm talking using stereotypical 
versions of like what's masculine or feminine, which sort of has to do probably with my age more than anything. But, um, <laughs> you know, so I was able to incorporate the best of both worlds and realize like, you know, hey, I don't have to. It was pretty dark. I mean, you know, once I had got sober and stopped drinking and using drugs and other addictive behaviors, you know, I was left with me. I was left with my authentic feelings about things. And I was very unhappy about a lot of the choices that I made and the and the boxes that I was sort of being put in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just, you know, and, and, and the other part of this, which is really interesting, I think your listeners might appreciate, is that, you know, I had this, and I didn't even know what it was called, but I had this really internalized homophobia about being gay. Like, I grew up in a family that freely used the, the, the F word, you know, faggot, and I don't know if you can swear on here, but. Yeah. You know, I won't use curse words, you know, the faggot, queer, you know, fairy, you know, Mary, you know, my brothers, you know, would constantly use those derogatory terms to tease me. And mm. even even teachers wow. in the six, seven, 60s and 70s were mm-hmm. allowed to like, hey, little faggot over there in the corner, stop talking or you're going to be sent to the principal's office. Wow. Can you imagine, you know, mm-hmm. doing so? So I had this already on top of the confusion that I felt about my gender. I had this really awful sense of like being gay was the worst possible alternative. Mm-hmm. You know, also being an effeminate gay boy in the gay culture in the 70s and 80s was not you know, it was not easy. It's still not easy for a lot of effeminate gay men mm-hmm. to uh, to find partners, to find love, to be taken seriously. You know, I mean, there's mm-hmm. there's a pot for every lid, but <laughs> at that time, it was it seemed like you know, his from a historic standpoint, the choices were very limited back then. You either, mm-hmm. you know, like you were a butch gay guy. Or if you were at all feminine, you were pegged or you were pigeonholed into like, oh, you should probably pursue a sex change or you should probably, you know, become trans. We didn't have transgender, transsexual, mm-hmm. you know, so it was the, the lanes were very, the lot, we didn't, people, people's awareness of what gender presentation was back then was practically non-existent. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't. We didn't have the gender non-conforming. We didn't have gender queer. We didn't have, you know, g- uh, non-binary. We didn't have. I mean, we had a word for it back then. You know, if you were running around in drag, like half drag and half boy drag, you know, they would call it scare drag or like, you know, gender gender fucking or whatever. Yeah. But but there weren't a lot of terms is what I'm saying. So the choices were pretty limited. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when you eventually, I guess, would you call it detransitioned? Is that a term you'd use I, or not really? I, I think that's the word they, that sort of evolved from this. But I prefer the word retransition because, you know, why uh-huh. would I want to go back to something that was so painful and difficult to begin with? Mm-hmm. And detransition sounds like negative to me. It sounds like mm-hmm. oh, it's, mm-hmm. it's kind of like going like yeah. Like it it kind of sounds, sounds like shaming. oh, I was I was wrong or I made a mistake, I was right? right? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, before you tell me a bit more about about that, which I'd love to hear about, I was thinking, looking back, do you <laughs> regret or would you do anything different about your gender journey if you had another chance? I've thought about this a lot. I think that, you know, I think if anything, I probably wouldn't have gone as far with the surgical interventions. Like I probably wouldn't have experimented with hormones and silicone and, you know, breast Mm -hmm. implants and, Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I probably would have been a drag queen, if anything. I mean, or, or you know, a drag performer. Mm-hmm. You know, I've done drag now as Brian. I, I, I actually, when I retransitioned back in the 80s, I fell into a theatrical troupe, which had a very long, stellar history as, uh, with drag performers, drag actors. Mm-hmm. It's a very famous theatrical company in the in Greenwich Village called the Ridiculous Theater Company, and so there I was after having this experience of you know retransitioning and becoming coming out as gay, and then I back in drag on stage as a drag performer mm-hmm. it was very interesting. So I think had I done anything differently, I might have. And I never really paid too much attention. I, I've always been kind of an impulsive, sort of reckless person in my youth. And so I never really paid much attention to consequences, mm-hmm. which is what I worry about, you know, for, for, for kids. You know, I worry about, like, kids to have that same mentality. Like, mm-hmm. they, you know, I, I never really had the wherewithal to think things through. Mm -hmm. to like think of like you know potential side effects or I never in my never imagined that I would be making this decision Mm -hmm. after all of those years of living as 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 a female Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know like I never thought like oh well maybe someday I might want to be a man again (laughs) you know I never (laughs) I never I never I never thought of that at all until much later in my life and you know, I have some 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 consequences physically from some of the choices that I made. You mm-hmm. know, especially with the silicone injections, uh, I had a very bad allergic reaction to the silicone, almost like right away. Mm-hmm. But it didn't stop me from continuing to do it. Right. And so I've had a couple of operations to sort of correct that, but they can never really correct it. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's something that, you know, I think, you know, I hadn't really thought of, you know, I was very young when I started to do it. I was 19 when I started, you know, running up to Harlem and jumping on some lady's kitchen table who does, she was a nurse at the doctor's office. She would steal the silicone from the doctor and then, you know, charge the, but it probably wasn't sterile. Wow. You know, yeah. probably was. Yeah. So I had a lot mm. of problems with that. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that might be, I guess the answer is that I would, you know, maybe I would just be a fabulous drag queen like, you know, RuPaul or, you know, or mm-hmm. Lady Bunny or, you know, um, some of the other kids today, you know, and, and yeah. RuPaul and Lady Bunny, they're not kids anymore. And but. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hindsight, huh? So when you were, I mean, I just wanted to revisit, like when you're in Germany, living as a, you know, military wife as such. So between then and sort of, I guess, coming out as a a gay man, what what happened there? I mean, tell me a bit more about the decision. Oh, that's a good question. No one ever asked me that question. That's a really good question. Ah. Because in Germany, I was sort of living this sort of, my fantasy life of like what I thought I was transitioning for in the first place. I was like, Mm -hmm. I was a woman and I was a wife of a soldier and I was keeping the house and I was shopping and cooking and not that those are bad things, Mm -hmm. but I was being entertaining. I would have the GIs come over to the, to the house and cook dinner for them and, go shopping on the PX, on the base. I would go to the commissary with the other wives. I would have parties. So in my mind during that time, I was thinking, wow, this is kind of fabulous. But actually, it wasn't. (laughs) I mean, Mm -hmm. it was was an amazing experience, um, Mm -hmm. which I've written about in my book, Transfigured. And... uh, you know, it was, it was kind of an out of body experience at times, but it also was very dangerous. Again, I never really thought of the consequences. You know, I mean, other GIs would hit on me or they would, you know, try to, you know, make a move on me. And 
you know, there's another story out there in the world called Soldier Story about it's a story based on uh, Calpurnia Adams, who was a trans woman who did have a boyfriend that was in the military. And when the guys found out that the boyfriend was seeing a trans woman, woman, they killed him. Wow. That's an, uh, a film. Uh, it was a film. Uh, I think it was in the 90s. I think it came out. Right. Uh, Jane Fonda's son was the actor who played uh, Troy Garrity. He played the mm. boyfriend of, of the uh, trans woman. So again, not thinking of, I mean, I guess some, I guess somehow I knew that that was a possibility. I had to always be very careful. So one of the things about it that I was, that was so challenging was I was always ha- a heightened state of awareness that, you know, this could go really badly. That sounds a bit stressful. And, yeah. and I found, and so there was always stress all the yeah. time, constant stress. Yeah. I was stoned most of the time. Mm. I smoked a lot of hash. I drank a lot of German beer with my 60 year old, you know, uh, German neighbor. And so, you know, I was always masking and never really fully dealing with the reality of, of how I really felt mm. about this situation and then the last part of it that was challenging was that my husband we loved each other and we were both very young and he was thinking along the lines that maybe I would have gender you know confirmation surgery and that was always Mm -hmm. the goal but by that time it wasn't the goal for me it was something more that I was questioning and I remember, I remember after leaving Germany, I think I wrote about this in my book. I hope I did anyway. But <laughs> I remember leaving in living uh, when we left Germany, we had to finish a tour of duty in Washington State. And there was a beautiful woman that lived on the ground floor uh, of our apartment. And she lived on the first floor. She was a lovely person, just really be- physically beautiful stunning redhead and I could see my husband was interested in her more than neighborly Mm -hmm. I'll just leave it at that Mm -hmm. and it really freaked me out and I remember waking up one day and just having a like a practical like I mean I had it like almost a nervous breakdown I was just Saw and I was close to thirty by that time. I, I was in my mid late twenties, and I was sobbing hysterically, and I could not understand what was going on. I just, I was just so freaked out by this idea of this idea that I just didn't know. You know, it, it was almost like a pre. It was almost like foreshadowing to what was going to come many a few years later. Mm-hmm. That I. I felt like, oh my God, I, I got to do something. And I wasn't sure what I should do. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I remember just this, this deep sorrow and it was almost like regret for like, you know, where I actually was in my transition at that time. Mm -hmm. And it really freaked him out. So then, you know, eventually, you know, he also became very domineering and very jealous and, you know, we didn't have, he never hit me, but we were in, we were having some issues in the relationship about what each of what one of us wanted and out of life. And eventually mm-hmm. I left him and uh, we split up. And that's when I, I, I jumped into my career in the nightclubs and I became Lord of sort of like a New York celebrity, you know, uh, darling of the, you know, the, uh, the media and it was like before cell, cell phones and before Twitter and before, you know, all that was, you know, we were out at parties every night ha- rubbing shoulders with, you know, famous people and performing and stuff. So, mm. yeah, but, but the Germany thing was sort of like, I did it. I also wrote a play about this and one of the lines in the play, which always got a great laugh was, you know, being a woman isn't all it's cracked up to be. And believe you me, it takes trying to be one to know. 
<laughs> That's fair. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. you know, I mean, you, you know, no one took me seriously as as my female self. They didn't think I had a thought between my cleavage. Mm. You know, I mean, they they you know, it was it was the misogyny alone. Mm. I don't. My heart goes out to women the way that they're treated uh, mm -hmm. by men and other women. You know, and other and yeah. gay men. I mean, the misogyny. You know, you, you yeah. know, I, I, that was another thing I never considered, you know, giving up my, my male privilege. Yeah. You know, if we want yeah. to have a conversation about that, that's a whole other, that's another podcast, but wow. you know, yeah. I, I, I relinquished my male privilege mm -hmm. to be a subservient, you know, like, you know, geisha, like, you know, sort of like, mm. you know, following the man and doing the man, whatever the man wanted me to do. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, the male or the so that was a whole trip into itself yeah um, well it's interesting what you said about internalized homophobia because we all have internalized misogyny as well and women obviously do too you know yes and um yeah I was terrified of being gay I did not want to be gay mm -hmm. it was so really what made the you last... embrace that in the end though because you did in the end, like, yeah. yeah well, <laughs> so I was thinking like, about the, the title you gave me for the, or, you know, when we talked about labels and stuff, or when you gave me the labels, yeah, you said you, you're a cis gay male of trans experience. Yeah. So that that's really interesting. So you've, you've kind of, would you say you've kind of gone full circle? Yeah, 360. Yeah. I was going to yeah. call my book 360. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because, but yeah. I, some people didn't like that title, but I always like that title, 360, because mm -hmm. really just yeah. tells you the, it could be 360 about anything. I mean, totally. I, yeah. I guess the publishers didn't want to go with that because it wasn't descriptive enough about, you know, mm. well, you went from A to B to C, but, but anyway, yeah. yes, it, it is sort of a full circle experience. And, you know, I often wonder, like, you know, I, I I'm so inspired at my late age of 65 years old by the progress that I see all around me of kids today that have these wonderful parents that are so supportive. Mm -hmm. And I get this question a lot too, when I've done other interviews and when I was on my book, book uh, tour, uh, you know, like, well, what would you suggest for parents of kids that are different or, or, you know, thinking about being trans or, you know, and I, the answer is really simple. Just love and accept your children for who and what they are mm -hmm. and support them in any way they feel they need to be supported because that love and acceptance, you cannot put a price tag on that because had I had that, as a child and growing up in the 60s and 70s, you know, my life might, I mean, my life has been pretty extraordinary, yes. <laughs> you know, in, in many ways. But, you know, I often think like, gee, what if someone turned up my light as a little boy rather than always trying to turn it down mm. or put it out? Yeah. And so that was my life, you know, and I, I guess I'm just fortunate in the fact that I was able to sort of persevere. And, you know, I had incredible mentors along the way and people that did sort of try to pull me up, you know, and see the value that I had as a person mm -hmm. in life. Mm -hmm. But that came much later in my life. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that had I had a different experience in a home at home and I had, you know, like some of the things that kids have today, I mean, there was no GSA, there was no gay straight Alliance club in high school. There was no counselor that you could go to, you know, and say, Oh, I'm feeling, you know, I'm having feelings for boys or, you know, I'm feeling like, you know, I'm very feminine. I don't know. People are uncomfortable. You know, people were always, always uncomfortable with my femininity mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I I remember clearly as a little boy thinking like I'm fabulous like I just <laughs> I'm so like I used to think like 
I th- I always felt like I was so special because I was different. Mm-hmm. Not shameful because I was different, but special until outside influences began to, you know, like I, I like to use this. this I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because I'm going to write another book. Mm-hmm. But turning out that light, like just, you know, dampening my spirit. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, it's hard to hard to make your way in the world if if the message you're receiving right from the get-go is that you're wrong there's something Mm -hmm. wrong about you you're 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 not right Mm -hmm. and so that was my challenge in life to figure it all out and uh luckily I did yeah and I love what you said about you went from a to b to c not a to b to a right (laughs) So in a way, the 360 is like, it's like a spiral, isn't it? Rather than a circle. So you're at the next level of the spiral, although it might seem like the same position is isn't something like that. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. And the thing about that, my story has never been a political story. This is, I'm not making any kind of political statement. I'm not Mm. making, I've I've avoided that like the plague. I just Mm. do not. I don't get into those discussions because I really feel that everyone's journey or everyone's path or, you know, whatever, whatever they choose in life is what they choose for themselves. Absolutely. And and I think that back then when I did decide to retransition, you know, I really freaked a lot of people out, like, because it wasn't Mm -hmm. really something that was very much into people's, you know, consciousness at the time in the 80s, I, in 1987, when I started to reverse, you know, some of the things that I'd done. But, and so it really freaked a lot of trans people out mm-hmm. because I think it, and I understand exactly why it would do that because it would, it could possibly, and it has been, uh, there have been attempts by outside you know, forces like right wing groups or mm-hmm. people that, you know, I know, I know this is a big thing in England right now that there mm-hmm. are a lot of, there's a lot of pushback uh, for decisions about, you know, transgender uh, youth. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I can see why that would be fearful for as a former trans person myself, mm-hmm. I could see, I mean, I still consider myself trans in some way, but yeah. Um, I'm not living as a transgender woman today, but I mm-hmm. could see why that would be challenging and scary, frightening for people to, for my narrative to be used as uh, against Yeah, them. Yeah, that makes sense. But, you know, what I hope, and I've been an advocate, and I'm also, I'm also becoming a, I'll be finished at the end of the year, I be, I'm bec- I've become a therapist. I'm going to mm-hmm. be a, a licensed mental health therapist in may 2022 nice. i'll be finishing my program and i become an I'm, I'm i've positioned myself as an advocate uh for this issue around you know people that decide you know maybe it's not something that they wanted to do and that i need we need to provide space for mm-hmm. those people people like myself in the same way that we've provided space for those who are transitioning and want to transition and take a different path from their gender assigned at birth. Mm -hmm. In the same respect, I feel like it would be hypocritical of the community to silence or criticize folks like myself Mm -hmm. who have found another way to be comfortable yeah, and in, in the end, it's, it's an individual journey, isn't it? It's not the yeah. same for anyone. It's, it's no. just your journey. No. No. Yeah, and 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 I love the title of your. I mean, I was so I can't tell you. I was so excited to to add another shade to you know to include another shade of gender because this is another part of gender that mm-hmm. you know it's only going to become more understood. Mm-hmm. You know, and and hopefully that will be by the work of people like myself and others 
you know, we live it. We, you talked about uh, mistakes earlier. You know, we live in a society where people that make mistakes are shamed into thinking that they shouldn't talk about it or they shouldn't, you know, mm-hmm. bring it out into the open. And, yeah. you know, and, and, and a lot of people, there uh, have been a lot of people in my position who won't talk about like, oh, they tried to go down this mm. path or they it didn't work out for them because they're afraid of being stigmatized, you know, because yeah. of changing their mind or making a mistake. Yeah. So I, I approach this whole idea about, you know, we just need to love and accept everyone for who and where they are in their life. Absolutely. And not judge, mm-hmm. you know, because, yeah. uh, I mean, I, 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 this is again, they're going back to this idea of like thinking things through and like, I never thought that coming out as gay after being trans was going to be something that was going to be like controversial. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I didn't see that coming at all. I thought, well, I'm going to be gay and it's going to be like, yay, Brian's gay now. Let's love Brian as a gay guy. <laughs> but don't talk about his past because that could be upsetting to people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You see yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. I like that because in a way, like it's, it's all to do with doing away with shame, you know, because there is enough yeah. of that in the world and we don't need any more of that. Yeah. Yeah. If you go on YouTube and put the word in, detransition you'll be shocked to mm. see what you I, what I, I don't think i will <laughs> no i mean yeah, shocked but, in, oh, in a totally. good way i mean yeah, yeah you would be yeah. like okay wow no, yeah, this is yeah. this is really something mm. that's happening to so, a lot yeah, it's, of it's people a, yeah educational so it's, it's, it's it's very it's probably more what you would you call it that there's more of it out there than people would think but yeah. I was thinking I would dread to think the reactions people get for that. You know, it must well, be. Well, there are some, some, you know, there are some factors that, you know, there, there's always going to be that. There's always going to mm. be someone that's, that's, you know, uneducated or ignorant or, mm. you know, make comments yeah. that are, you know, like, you know, yeah. I, even ha- I even read one comment of, about my book on, on Goodreads or something. Like some guy said, well, gee, can't this guy make up his mind? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like like that was the point of the book. I mean, like, is that's all you took out of the book was like, I couldn't make up my mind? I mean. See, yeah, that's an interesting one. Because like, even though you retransitioned rather than detransitioned, you ended up at point C, not back at point A. So in a way, it's kind of like taking a journey, isn't it? Like going on a holiday. You're just going to go home again, so you might as well not go. Well, that's not the point of the journey, is it? Right? Right. Right. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. But I was doing a paper for school, and I happened to Google this title, the detransition, and I ended up on Mm. YouTube. And mm-hmm. there's quite a lot of testimonies of young folks, you know, some people older, some, but mostly mm-hmm. a lot of young people. Mm-hmm. And they are talking very honestly and uh, openly about this, which was refreshing, it was really, really. Yeah. I stopped yeah. counting after 200. Wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. hits. Yeah. I think the risk is when people start to think, Oh, detransition or retransition, whatever term you want to use in the end, that, that's a thing. So no one should transition because it's all wrong. You know, that's that's when it starts getting in dangerous territory, really, isn't it? Yeah. Because everyone's different. And for some people, it could be right. And for some people, it could not be. And I think some people might regret it and would change yeah. it. Other people would not. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. And I think we get into trouble when we start telling people what to do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like, I think that's where that that's where uh, a lot of the controversy is today. That people want to tell people what they should should or shouldn't do around their own mm-hmm. person. It's similar to the abortion issue. You know, it's like yeah. you know, mm-hmm. who, how am I going to tell a woman not to have an abortion? I mean, that's nothing, nothing to 
do with me at all. That's could totally. be my opinion, but I mean, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not anti-abortion, mm-hmm. but you know, I mean, that has nothing to do with, that's a personal decision. Totally. You know, in autonomy? the same way as mm-hmm. anything you're coming out about, like if you're coming out as, as a, you know, as a, a, a transvestite, if you're fetishizing, you know, women's clothes and that's your thing. If you're a cross dresser, you need to be, you know, embraced and accepted for that's what you like to do. Or if you're a leather queen and you want to be living your life as a leather, you know, enthusiast or, you know, whatever mm-hmm. your thing is, it's. Yeah. That's your thing. <laughs> I'm not there to judge. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I was judged so much in my mm-hmm. life for the choices that I made as a trans woman mm-hmm. that I would be the last person on earth to have any judgment about anyone else's choices that they mm-hmm. make today. Yeah. I know what it's like to be judged. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's not, not pretty. Totally. Wow. That's quite a story. I mean, yeah. Yeah. You said you're writing another book, but your first book was called um, Transfigured, My Journey from Boy to Girl to Woman to Man, which is a catchy title, if anything. (laughs) (laughs) Probably not something you see anywhere else. So um, is it how long has it been out? Was it 2018? Did I see that right? Yeah, It was published in 2018. And uh, it is uh, it's still available. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think it's you know, it's you can still find it. It's still selling. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a small publisher um, in New York, mm-hmm. which was recently bought by Simon and Schuster. And um, yeah, the first print run. There's there's a few copies left out of the first print run. So I know mm-hmm. I don't know whether they're going to re-release it as paperback yet. I think we have mm-hmm. to wait another another year for that. But right, it's available on audiobooks. Excuse me. There's a fellow that they hired to read the book. I didn't get to read it myself for the audio book, but oh, okay. there's yeah. a fellow book actor that they mm. hired, which did a tremendous job oh, good. reading all the characters in the book. And um, yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah, and you said that the second book you're writing. What is that about? Well, my my next book is going to be about reclaiming my my male uh, gender, one pronoun mm. at a time. Wow. Yeah, because I touch on it at the in the book, but I don't get enough. There's not enough. There weren't enough pages for me to include that experience in this book. But I'm going to I uh, people always want to know more about like, OK, so what happened then? Mm-hmm. You know, how did you undo, you know, you know, what was it like mentally, emotionally, physically mm-hmm. to reclaim my male identity uh which had up until that point been gone mm-hmm. wow, yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm hoping to do that um when i finish my my uh program that's going to be my next project and there's also a documentary in the can also that was premiered at the new york city doc fest mm-hmm. um and we were at south by southwest online on amazon last year called I'm Gonna Make You Love Me, which is a documentary directed and produced by Karen Bernstein, who was a former uh, producer at American Master. And that, you know, what happened was it was released. We we made our premiere in New York and then COVID hit. Mm. And everything shut down and everything. So um, I know that she is trying to, she's still looking to seek distribution for that right now as well yeah. and there's uh you know there's been a book there's been a, a stage play which i wrote in 2000 there's mm-hmm. a documentary and presently i just you know completed another draft of my full-length feature film mm. wow you yeah. got a lot going so, on yeah i've been busy <laughs> yeah sounds I've it been biz- busy <laughs> and uh yeah, amazing. And I'm grateful for you know I'm, I'm I'm grateful to have the opportunity to you know to do all these things in my life you mm. know today. So it's been 
been a gift mm. really to yeah well do you have anything you'd like to add that we haven't talked about yet we've talked about a lot yeah 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 we packed in wow. a lot of a lot of things to uh mm. no I, I i i i i unless you have any other questions um i, I don't mean today think i mean today i I'm, mm -hmm. I'm married. I'm, you know, I'm in a long, I'm married for almost, well, 19 years, ah. you know, with my mm -hmm. husband today. And uh, I'm, like I said, I'm, you know, finishing up my, my master's program and, you know, life is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, uh, I think we covered a lot. We did. We yeah. absolutely did. Yeah. yeah. We covered a lot. And um, yeah. Mm hmm. I'm I'm just just thrilled to do this this podcast. Love me. <laughs> because and I want I want to always be the voice of, you know, reason and mm. I want people to what if take whatever they take away from my story is that I want people to understand that making the decision to return or retransition was was equally if not more difficult than mm -hmm. deciding to transition in the first place. Yeah. 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 So it was quite a process. Amazing. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. And and from that, you know, I, I hope that people will understand that um there's an equal there's there's a lot of I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, people that undergo this take this path or they decide to take a different different turn in life mm -hmm. you know are val valuable you know we're valuable resources in the sense that you know anyone with you know with experience about matters like this we can learn mm -hmm. a lot from definitely so i yeah. hope people can learn a lot from my um my experience as you know difficult as it has been at times mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's a lot to be gained from it yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah well thank you so much for sharing yes thank you it was lovely to meet you and I'm, I'm, you I know people can't see us but we've had quite a <laughs> quite a lovely conversation here and yeah. uh, I'm very very grateful to be a part of 50 shades of gender Yay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Esther. You can find out more details on the website at 50shadesofgender.com forward slash Brian, where you can also read the transcript. And you can find out more about Brian on his website, brianbelovich.com, which is B-E-L-O-V-I-T-C-H, and on social media. Links are on the episode page. Thank you for listening to the 50 Shades of Gender podcast. You can find us online at 50shadesofgender.com, on social media, and on YouTube. Again, if you'd like to support us, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash 50 shades of gender or buy us a coffee. Links are on the website. We hope you will listen again. Until then, stay curious and open minded. Drink time. That's a good idea. <laughs> what is it you're drinking? I'm having a lovely Diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having some green tea. I've already had two cups of coffee. It's earlier here. <laughs> mm, mm, yeah.